So we're on page, um, well, we're on paragraph nine, which is page four. And at a certain point, we're getting into a lot of just boilerplate stuff. And so going through this quickly, 9A is the buyer, the default setting is the buyer is going to intend to occupy the property. If they're an investor, a flipper, or that sort of thing, you would check the box that they're not going to uh, um, occupy the property. Seller occupied or vacant. Notice how they 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 make those two different. Yes, question. How do you protect yourself if the buyer is potentially lying to you? How do you protect yourself if the buyer is potentially lying to you? Well, I, I made all my buyers go through polygraph testing <laughs> and and truth serum and yes. waterboarding and then and then that's that's usually how you. Why what, was it related to closing in possession or regarding to this? We're on paragraph page. I don't know page four, paragraph nine. Yeah, it's uh, that top question. Buyer intends or, or does not intend to occupy the property as buyer's primary residence. I've never heard of anyone lying about this. I worked with an agent back in two thousand seven, and we had a client who were looking to. Well, people lie about where they live on a regular basis, exactly. right? And so, as an agent, you it's when you're complicit in their lying. Now, the problem here, let's say the buyer clicks on, the buyer doesn't click anything, so the buyer is basically saying they intend to occupy the property as their personal residence. Usually when they lie about that, they're doing it because the loan terms are more favorable if you are an owner occupied than if you're an investor. Um, the reality is, is that lying to a federally regulated and insured lender committing fraud against them is a felony exactly. and it's investigated by the FBI, prosecuted in federal court, and they would go to a federal prison, right, so if caught. Just say that to them? Well, the, the idea, I mean, I have you had somebody say, I'm going to mark this, but I have no intention of being there. Um, for that period of time, that's, I, I don't, you know, the, I would just make sure people understand that if they do that, the, the and, and some loan programs actually have penalties if you change your mind, right? But um, they, they, lie, you should discourage people from deliberately defrauding a federally, all lenders that are making first loans are federally regulated and insured. And so, right. And that, that's why people so do it. I, the, the, telling them it's a felony, well, there's nothing else you can do. No, it's not, you're not the one who's, they're supposed to honestly answer this if they don't honestly answer it. I guess you could take the position that you're not going to write up the offer if you know that they're deliberately lying. If you were to ask, I guess that's the proper answer. Yeah. Right, yeah. but, but they're the, this is their statement. Right, and you know, um, but Mike, can I ask you a question on this? Is that okay? Can, about that form? Yeah. Well, let's. Can we do that? Uh, can are you gonna? I'm gonna be. This won't be very long. Let me just. So, seller occupied or vacant property, possession shall be delivered to the buyer. Um, this is a typical default where people don't mess with it. Um, you could change the date or time. Most people do not. Um, so basically it says possession is upon the day escrow closes. You could check no later than a couple of days after the close of escrow. Generally speaking, uh, 9B is one where we don't usually put in anything extra. All right. So if you're marking this, you hopefully have a very good reason because normally we don't do that. Seller remaining in possession, if the seller has the right to remain in possession, there's a place to mark. Notice there's the SIP form. There's basically two forms that you could use. And one of them, the easy one, is called the SIP form, which is that one. Now notice as soon as I click on it, it's added that form. 
right? And if I were to click on the other one, the RLAS, it will add that form. Now, the, the SIP form, th let me just say something about this. The, this form should be done, in fact, notice how it automatically was added. It should, why don't, why don't we take a look at it? Doesn't that sound like fun? Don't you, don't you really want to see this form? Yes. Seller in possession. All right. Now, this is the easy form. And so you would mark it's the residential purchase contract, dated. You'd have to put in the date. And it's filled in a lot of the information. But let's just look at this. Seller to remain in possession of so many days after close of escrow. Now, if it's more than 30 days, 30 days or longer, they basically suggest that you should use the other form. The other form is essentially a full-blown residential listing, I mean, a residential lease agreement. Um, and some people don't want to fill this out. But let's say we were going to have a 15-day rent back, or I don't know what else you'd put in, days after close of escrow, sellers the right to remain in possession. Compensation. Now, where I've seen this turn ugly is, is that all of this isn't worked out in advance, right? And so when you click on it, it now adds the form, which is a really good thing because it makes you think about it. How much is the seller is how much is the seller going to pay in terms of rent? Now, this by the the worst thing you could do is type in blank or buyer's P I T I, right? This is what I, I oftentimes see. And there's so if you say buyer's principal interest taxes insurance divided by 30 per day or some formula. The problem is we don't really know what that is. And there have been cases where the buyer says, I'm putting, um, I have 40% down or something like that. And their PITI, if you calculated it, would be not that huge. And then they end up getting a 90% loan. And now their principal interest taxes and insurance is very, very high and the seller doesn't want to pay the higher amount and they want to be paid the amount they're actually spending and um, it's um, a kerfuffle, right? Now paragraph K, which we went over on another session, talks about buyer stated financing in the first sentence, I'm sure you all know what the first sentence is in paragraph K, right? I'm sure you do, but it says the seller is relying on the stated financing the buyer has given, right? I'm paraphrasing it a little bit. So then you could argue it, but where I'm going with this is you want to put in a dollar amount and you'd like the dollar amount to be put in at the time you're writing the offer rather than figuring it out later. Now, I realize this is a seller's market, so people are sometimes, but you should put in, if you represent the buyer, so much per day, right? Now, you might figure that out by taking your assumed principal interest taxes and insurance and dividing it by 30, but it should be a dollar amount, not a formula to be determined later. Then it says security deposit. Now, sometimes sellers don't want to leave one, right? Because they're like horrified that you would suggest that they would damage their own house, right? Which is no longer there which is no longer theirs. But what happens, what do you think the house looks like when all the furniture is moved out? Does it look the same as it did when the furniture's there, right? And so if you were the, what happens is the seller moves out and things are broken, right? From the walkthrough to the time they move out, you can do a second walkthrough, right? You should do two walkthroughs, one before they own the house and then one before they leave. But if you don't have a security deposit, what can you do if you find that the seller's broken stuff? What can you do? Ask them to please write you a check, right? So now I realize in a seller's market, if there was multiple offers and somebody said, we don't care about the security, we don't care about all of that, but you might want to think about that. Security <laughs> deposit and that the escrow holder, they, they'll be held with escrow from the seller proceeds. Late charges and checks. Now this is a if this is only if payment is being made outside of escrow. 
They write, you, you'd think they have all this money, but they're writing bad checks. Right? Utilities, who's paying for that when after escrow closes? Right? Is the buyer paying for it? Is the seller paying for it? Are you transferring utilities? Um, if the utilities are transferred to the buyer upon the close of escrow, is the seller going to pay so much for utilities? You might say, I don't really care. Uh, entry, um, this says the buyer, do you understand the buyer is now a landlord? Maintenance, like a lot of this is pretty straightforward, but look at insurance. Look, let's just mention that for a second. Um, if you're the old homeowner, you have homeowner's insurance. Homeowner's insurance only covers you if you're a homeowner. So when you sell the property and escrow closes, you're no longer a homeowner. All right. So you're a renter. Now the buyer has homeowner's insurance, but that only covers the buyer as a homeowner and doesn't include rentals. Right? Do you understand? But you're basically saying is that during the rent back, there is no insurance on the property because if something happens and they find out that a tenant actually was in the premises at the time something went on, the insurance company might say, well, you should have had a tenant policy. Right? You didn't have a tenant policy. Right? Now, could you get a tenant policy? Yeah, if you call the whoever's doing the homeowner's insurance up and you say, hey, we're running it back, they're like, for about 15 days or something like that, we need to get a tenant. They're going to say, sure, we'll be happy to sell you one, right? But who's going to pay for that? So is that on top of the homeowner's policy? That's, right. Yes, it's because the homeowner's policy does not include rental coverage. But is it on top of or instead of? It's on top of. It's on top of because the rental property generally doesn't include structure and things like that, only includes the, so, but you understand this is a, because what I've seen when these things turn ugly is, is that none of this is discussed up front. Nothing is ever done. And then it all go, it all goes sour. It all goes sour, right? So who, so on the renter's policy, is there a usual way? Usually the, usually the tenant pays for the tenant's policy. Yeah. Right. Now, could the buyer just say, I don't care. I'm, uh, I don't, I don't care. I'm, uh, I'll pay for it or I don't care. We don't need it. Uh, you know, that's possible. But this is something that you should, um, you know, you should discuss. Definitely you should discuss. It says the seller has to maintain the property. It says the seller is supposed to let you come and look at it before, you know, possession. So the SIP form is what you use if you're having a short-term rent back. If you're doing the long-term rent back, which is more than 30 days or 30 days or more, you're supposed to use the really, really long form, the scary form the four page long form, right? And if we click on this, that form is going, and that's a regular full blown residential lease agreement. <coughs> and I've known agents that are hesitant to do this, but there's a reason they have a really long lease agreement because there's all these different things that could go wrong. Um, and it's good to look at them. So, and by the way, I see agents even if it's like two months rent back, they want to use the SIP form because they're afraid of showing the seller the long version because the seller's not going to like it. All right, sellers, what do you mean? This is this we've lived here and taken care of the house, and now you think we have to give you a security deposit? That's what do you think of us? All right. Um, tenant occupied property, property shall be vacant at least five days prior to the close of escrow. That's what it says. If you're unable to deliver property vacant in accordance with rent control or other applicable law, you may be in breach of this agreement or tend to remain in possession. Uh, you just need to look at that. Um, I've sold fourplexes and duplexes where the last thing the, the buyer wanted is for the tenant to move out. Right now, if you click on tenant to, rem to remain in possession, then this form is going to pop up. Are you interested? Do you, do you care about this form? So the tenant to remain in possession, I guess we're 
This seems like fun. So the tip, the tenant in possession form, it's a fun thing to go through and click on all the boxes, right? Just to see what, what it looks like. So um, seller shall, with basically it's talking about seller shall transfer the buyer through escrow, all unused tenant deposits, and if any, all prepaid but unearned rent, if any. So unused tenant deposit. So for example, if the tenant has a security deposit, it's supposed to be transferred from the seller to the buyer. Right? Did that make sense? Right? If they paid first and last month rent or prepaid rent, that should be transferred. Now, you understand in proration, the escrow companies are good at this, but rent is paid at the beginning of the month, typically. For the whole month. If escrow closes in the middle of the month, then it means half of the month the property belongs to the buyer, and but the seller has the rent. All right? Do you understand? When the first of the month the buyer pays for the whole month to the seller, but the seller doesn't own it for the whole month. So that means the seller has to credit the buyer the days of rent from close of escrow to the end of the month. As well, the th th it, you do whatever the, the they generally do whatever the I just picked 30 days as a assuming that that was a 30 day month. It was 31. They actually prorated over 31. Right. I think you're supposed to do it 30 regardless if it's 28, 29. Or I don't. I that the bankers the, the not I, they usually just do whatever the number of days are. Okay. It's not a big difference, but basically you get half a month's worth. Right. So you're crediting the buyer. The buyer. Okay. Because the seller, almost all rent is prepaid. Right. Right, because you pay at the beginning of the month. Right. So if escrow closes on the 15th, then the seller has gotten one month's rent, but didn't own it for the whole month. And half of the month, the buyer owns it, but the buyer's been paid no rent. So, so you're crediting the buyer, the buyer over a number of days. Whatever number of days, it's or half a month, whatever, whatever number of days. So no warranty shall be made concerning compliance with government restrictions and the amount of rent. So basically it says we don't know anything about rent control. Seller shall within so many days deliver to all estoppel certificates. Does everyone know what an estoppel certificate is? Tenant to fill it out to say that all the conditions of the Yeah. Right, and estoppel, so do you think it's possible, in this market maybe it's not as likely, but it's think, you think it's possible that the lease says the tenant is paying $2,000 a month, right? That's what the lease says. And the tenant had come to the owner last year and said, look, at $2,000 a month is ridiculous. There's a place right down the street. I can get it for only $1,700 a month. If you don't lower my rent, $1,700 a month, I'm going to leave. And the landlord says, all right, fine, just give me $1,700 a month. All right, so the tenant's paying $1,700 a month. The lease says $2,000. Right, now you're the buyer. What does the seller show you? It shows you what the lease says, $2,000. Is that what the tenants are paying? That's not what the tenants are paying. The tenants are paying an amount different from what the lease says. All right, so the estoppel certificate is a certificate for the tenant to fill out, saying, how much rent are you really paying? How much of a deposit did you really give, right? Because later the, the landlords developed, the sellers developed amnesia later about how much of a security deposit they really had, and then the tenant saying, no, I really gave them a lot more than that. You get the idea. Um, anyhow, it's called, and there is a form, there's a CAR form called an estoppel certificate. Um, sellers should give by a written notice of any changes to existing lease tenancies or new agreements to lease proposed changes so sorry, cases where they basically, during escrow, it seemed like, changed the rental amounts, right? You know, um, so you're not supposed to be, that's considered bad form to show one thing and then end up making changes. Buyer's approval of the rental agreements is a contingency of this agreement, right? And so you, if, there, if the tenants are remaining in possession, you definitely want to click this box and have this form filled out. And so the buyer has five days after receipt to read it and decide if they like it or not. Isn't that, huh? isn't that fun? <laughs> isn't that fun? And then um, I forgot all the 
it's really cool that they just pop right up now. Mm-hmm. All right, so well, that was that was that one. Now a lot of this, it says uh, warranty rights, uh, right? So right, keys, passwords, codes, all that other kind of stuff. Garage door openers, right? So all that stuff. Um, they're supposed to turn over statutory and other disclosures. Um, this basically lists a lot of the things that we've already talked about. There's the lead-based paint disclosures, which is just one of the forms, the natural hazard disclosure, the SPQ or SSD, notice it says or. Um, any statutory disclosures required by this paragraph are considered fully completed if seller has answered all the questions and completed and signed the seller's actions and the listing agent, if any, has completed and signed the listing broker sections or agent vigilance. So this says any statutory disclosure required is considered fully completed if the seller has checked all the boxes. That's what it says. Nothing stated herein relieves the buyer's broker, if any, from the obligation to contact a reason to conduct, excuse me, a region, reasonably con- competent and diligent visual inspection of the accessible areas and disclose this is the AVID material facts. So basically, it's just a warning paragraph. Um, you can't waive the lead based paint unless exempt. There's a the, the default setting now is that you get the SPQ. And you now have to check the OR box to get the Supplemental Contractual and Statutory Disclosures, the SSD. The only difference, or the difference, is, is that the SSD is basically page one of the SPQ. And it has that list of statutory required questions, but doesn't have all the other sections asking if they've ever done anything to the property. Um, what else is interesting here? It says in sex, in the event seller or listing broker prior to the close of escrow becomes aware of the adverse conditions materially affecting the property or any material inaccuracy, um, private, um, seller shall promptly provide a subsequent or amended disclosure covering writing. However, a subsequent or amended disclosure shall not be required for conditions and material inaccuracies of which buyer is otherwise aware. Notice how they highlighted this or disclosed in reports obtained by the buyer or ordered by the, uh, obtained by the buyer or ordered and paid for. So basically what this is saying, and, and this is, I've always found annoying, but so the property inspector finds something wrong with the property and it contradicts something that's in the transfer disclosure statement. And so the agent, I've had selling agents insist that we revise the transfer disclosure statement, we amend it and give it to them because the report shows that there's something wrong, right? And basically, and notice how they've highlighted it, it says, uh, if you've already gotten a report that says what the, the problem is, we don't have to amend the transfer disclosure statement. Now, does anyone know why you don't want to amend the transfer disclosure statement? nullify the contract and they could back out. It gives the buyer three days to back out, right? So if you amend the transfer disclosure statement, they have three days to cancel the agreement. Three days more. From the day you give them the amendment. Um, if any disclosure notice were specified in 10A1 or subsequent amended disclosure or notice is delivered to buyer after the, after the offer is signed, buyer shall have the right to cancel this agreement with three days after delivery. That's what the next paragraph says. So agents would say, well, you know, you, the, the property inspector found something wrong and we want you to amend. And then they would say, oh, we're, we're canceling. Well, a- anyhow, so you don't amend the TDS if it's simply because an inspection found something that you missed or had wrong. Yeah, and Mike, so they shouldn't do it because the you're just asking the buyer to say what, I mean, the, the seller saying everything that they know and the inspector may find something that... Sometimes I've had people say no to a leak and they, when you ask them the question, they remembered that it was in fact okay. leaking there. They really didn't know, they just had temporary memory loss when they filled out the form. So natural environmental and other booklets. You know, you've, you've seen that you need to get the receipt from it. Withholding taxes, um, that's the FERP 
Pacta and the California withholding, and we talked about that, I think. Megan's Law, we talked about that. Notice regarding gas and hazardous liquid pipelines, that's, we actually have a disclosure regarding that. Condominium and plan development disclosures, if this only applies if it's there, and if you're in a condominium or planned development. And basically what they're looking for is a homeowner association. So, you know, I own a house in a, it's a single family home detached in a homeowner association. So you would still, that's a common interest subdivision, even though it's not a condominium. Condition of the property, this basically says the buyer can do anything they want to to inspect it, but it says, unless otherwise agreed to in writing, the property is sold as is in its present condition and subject to the buyer's inspection rights. So what you should not do, in my opinion, is to write up an as-is clause. It, it, in other words, the contract is an as-is contract. So if you write an offer and you add an addendum that says property is to be purchased as is, or the listing agent counters your offer with a clause that says property is to be purchased as is, I'm thinking these people are morons, right? That's what I'm thinking, right? You know, because the contract says it's an as is contract. And by the way, legally, if, do you understand how the, this would go in a court? Because the court's going to be, the lawyer is going to be suggesting that you have modified the terms of this contract by putting that clause in. And if you say, right, do you understand because you, you found it necessary to change the language somehow of the contract. Do you understand if you're talking about as is in a counteroffer and addendum, then it must mean you don't like the way it's explained here. Is that right? It's already in there. Right, but you understand if you mention it in a counteroffer or an addendum, then the the lawyer is going to be saying, well, if then your intent was to change what's in the contract. Isn't that right? Even though it says the same thing. Even though it says the same thing. You made a change. Right. So why would what was it about this you didn't like? Do you understand this will be an uncomfortable conversation mm -hmm. when you're in the witness stand? or being deposed by a lawyer as to what was it about the form written by the lawyers of the California Association of Realtors that you found to be insufficient and needed to be restated, right? Do you, do you under, and the real estate agents are notorious for doing this, but I always considered it, I just sigh when I would see that they would repeat, they'd say, as is, make sure it says as is. Well, it, it sort of, seems to say that it's as is, right? And you get into trouble when you're rewriting the words that are in the form. Um, subject to buyer's investigation rights. So, by the way, I mentioned this when we go to all of those different inspections and reports, you don't ever have to check and add in, this is back on paragraph four, I believe, that the, the buyer has the right to order a property inspection. This says, Essentially, you can order any kind of inspection you want. That's really subject to buyer's investigation rights, which is coming up in the next paragraph. It says you can do anything you want. Um, and it says, buyer is strongly advised to conduct investigations of the entire property in order to determine its present condition. Seller may not be aware of other factors. Property improvements that are built may not be built according to code and compliance with current law or have had permits issued. And then there's this really long paragraph and it says buyers, one of the fun things to do, by the way, is to print out one of these contracts and get a yellow or pink or some highlighter and mark everywhere you can find where it says it's a contingency. This says buyer's acceptance of the condition of an any other matter, any other matter affecting the property is a contingency of this agreement. Right? Any other matter. And then it goes on basically to list every inspection you've ever heard of and also includes the right to conduct other ones. I've had asbestos inspections, right? not a common thing, right? 
There's asbestos everywhere, by the way. Just thought I would show that one. You know, um, so they can do all the inspections that they want. Seller shall make the property available. Copies of all such investigation reports obtained by a buyer shall survive. They must give seller at no cost. Copies of all such investigation reports obtained by a buyer, which obligation shall survive the termination of the agreement. So even if it comes in late, you're still supposed to give the seller a copy. Um, and then D basically says that if anything goes wrong because of the inspector, it's the buyer's problem. Or if the inspector breaks the sprinkling system or something like that. So it says. Um, title investing. This is just a long boilerplate thing that goes through the different, you know, you get a prelim. Um, how about this? There's a part here. The preliminary report, uh, uh, title is taken as presented on conferences, buyers assuming that. So when time period, let me find the words. To prelim, preliminary report. Um, title is taken in its present condition, encumbrances, easement condition, restrictions and rights whether of record or not, as of the date of acceptance. Um, and within the time period, close of escrow. And uh, I'm looking for the words. Title is in present condition. Just... Um, anyhow, um, you're going to get a prelim and essentially title is also a contingency. They have to accept the condition of title. Um, and yeah, uh, the, you're looking for that sentence? Yeah. That's B. The third one, third sentence in on A. Oh yeah. Oh. It says, oh yes, yeah, buyer's review of the preliminary report and any other matters which may affect title or contingency of this agreement. I was, that was it. Thank you very much. My old age. This is just another one. So title is a condition, to, is a contingency. And the manner of taking title may have significant legal and tax consequences. Consult an appropriate professional. Do they have, they don't have to know when they write the offer, but they should know before they sign off how they want title. And uh, I don't want to really get into that. The title companies have this little chart about the different ways. It, it's taxes is really mostly the big thing about the different ways of taking title. Um, buyers shall have a CLTA. And then I would come and listen to Rita Alam talking about the preliminary title report, which is next Tuesday. Sorry, in case you were interested. Time periods, removal of contingencies, cancellation rights. Um, so you can change these in our market. 17 days was just like pulled out of a hat, right? Just pulled out of a hat. It's not a, there's no magical number. Um, you could put down 10 days is very common right now. If the listing agent and the seller have provided everything up front, some people put down zero days or two days or something like that. And I don't know what else to say about here. Um, continuation of the contingency is there's something interesting about that. Um, so removal of the contingency, it says even after the end of the time specified in paragraph 14 B one, which would be the 17 or 10 days and before seller cancels, if at all, buyer retains the right in writing to either remove contingencies or to cancel this agreement. Now we, there's a, uh, a form which is called the seller repair request, which we might, it's not a very long form, but essentially what this says is the buyer, let me just see if I can summarize this. The buyer has so many days to do all their investigations and request, this is the, within the time period specified in that paragraph, request that the seller make repairs. And this is the form R, 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 R. And there was an agent who contacted me and she was confused because the um, listing agent had said, put it on the 
four, number four, R form. And the number four R form. And so she was saying, you know, she wanted to know what that form was. It's the R R R R, which is it's a it's a pirate thing. Um, <laughs> it's a pirate form, and basically, it's a. I, do we want to look at that too? Do, 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 I'm sure you do. <laughs> I'm sure you want to look at the uh, request for repairs. Notice, and they have a whole bunch of them, right? And that's, uh, and then there's a seller response to the buyer request for repairs. Why don't we do? Why don't we do them both? Just because I can tell you guys are just really <laughs> curious about this, right? Maybe not. So, um, why are there five of them? There's why are there five? Well, there are two different theories as to why there are five forms. In many of the cases, you're going to see there are four. Like, and one reason. Um, so let's say it was a fourplex. Right, and the other so if there's multiple units, then you might have multiple requests for repairs per unit. Right, if you look at the, let's just look at it. Um, the other is is that over time, as you're going back and forth, there's arguments about the the form. So this is not a complicated form, and it says by request that the seller prior to do and you list it all out and then there's a place to put in section one and section two and as a report dated by and a report dated by or credit the buyer or that the seller reduce the price those are the basic ones and then you attach the copies of the forms now it used to be a big mess in fact it was Jeff made a reference to that answer the question somebody answered the question but in the old version, there, there were times, there was a time when buyers would say to the seller, I want a section one termite clearance. And the seller would say yes, sometimes, without knowing what that is, right? And I don't, I haven't, I haven't won any awards for this, but I had a listing that had $50,000 worth of section one work, right? So that's not the most I've ever heard of, but that's a, that's a lot of section one work. Right. So um, what they're now doing is rather, and do you think there could be more than one report? Because I, I used to know different termite companies if I wanted a high estimate or a low estimate, there was different people to call, right? So there was one company that was no, just famous for, I, I thought they sent blind people out to look at the, look <laughs> at the property, right? You know, because they couldn't seem to find anything wrong. And this other company, it was like a team of Sherlock Holmes people with magnifying glasses looking up, right? You understand it? You, you, you figure out who gives a high and who gives a low estimate. So what you can do now is say section one and you, you specify what report you're talking about, which one. So you know how much, right? And you also could do a credit, but this is the form that you're supposed to use when you're asking for a seller credit for repairs, right? This should not, this should be done not part of the purchase contract, right? Does everybody understand that? You made me laugh. Not part of the purchase contract. And then, well, you reference the purchase contract in it, but what, do, what, does anybody know what I mean by saying that it's not part of the purchase agreement? Where I'm going with that? If, if you don't have it, if you don't have it, like if, if the buyer doesn't want any repairs, you don't have to include it, right? Well. I know why you don't want to include it, but I don't know how you then make it part of the initial. Well, what, where I'm going with this is the lender may not want to see this. Yeah. Right? The lender may not want to see this. Because it's just confusing to the lender to see this. So you don't necessarily, you, we don't want confused lenders, so you don't have to send the, you, the lender wants the purchase agreement and the lender wants counter offers and that sort of stuff all done at the time, right? But this should come maybe later, right? Where, and you don't need to bother them with that, right? So you might be discussing it as part of the agreement, but you don't. 
But you might, but this would be a separate form. The lender doesn't ask the lender. By the way, if you're going to have a conversation with a lender, the way to do it is to say, let me ask you a hypothetical question, right? <laughs> what would you, and, and they're going to give you a, an answer to your question. But I'm just saying. So here's the seller's request. Seller either agrees to uh, accept or to credit or to reduce the payment. Seller agreement applies if buyer both, one, removes the following contingencies um, or those contingencies or none, right? So usually it would, and releases seller and brokers from any loss liability regarding disclosed condition of the property. Um, or seller does not agree or other, I don't know what the other possibly could be. We, and then the buyer gets to respond to this. So basically what the seller is saying, all right, if I fix that stuff, are we done? Is it over? You've removed your contingency. There's not going to be any more, right? Otherwise, because people sometimes will come back with a second list and another list. And anyhow, does that make sense? All right. And it, it's a pretty straightforward form, but um, it's better to use this form rather than an addendum. I've had agents that are experienced ask me, I was walking by and the guy asked me, he said, uh, uh, he's representing the buyers and he wanted to ask for repairs. And he says, is there like a form to do that? Or do I just like write a letter or something? I was like, there's actually a form to do that. Um, so you can submit it with your purchase contract, but you wouldn't give it to the lender? Generally, we're not doing this at, uh, you could, but generally this is not being done at the time the agreement is written. The, the most, the easy, do you understand what the easiest way to do this is, is that if you, let me just address that. So let's say you've got all the inspections and reports and you want something fixed before escrow closes. The, you should have a call with the listing agent and ask that the price be reduced or credit is given and uh, would the seller be amenable to that to cover this expense? And if the seller, and if you get back a yes at that price, you'll get a credit uh, or, a, you know, we will change the price. Now for the buyer, a credit is worth more than a change in the price. Do you understand if you have an 80% loan, it means that you're only putting down 20 cents on the dollar and the bank is putting down 80. So if they lower the price $10,000, it only saves you two, right? But if you get a $10,000 credit, you get all $10,000, right? So the buyer, when they think it through, would rather have a credit than a reduction in the price, unless the buyer is all cash, in which case, it doesn't really matter, right? And so it would be way better to negotiate credits and price before making, without doing the repair request, right? Do you understand? So the repair request is generally used when we discover something we did not know after the offer has been accepted. But if you haven't written the offer yet, build it into the price. Then where am I? Why am I here? Where am I? All right. It's a residential purchase agreement. How about this? All right. So that was more fun than I thought. Um, and where are we now? We've done page five. That's the title. Contingencies. Those of escrow. Um, so buyer, let's talk about seller right to cancel. Seller right to cancel buyer contingencies. If by the time specified in this agreement, buyer does not deliver to seller removal of the applicable contingencies. And there's a form for that. Um, buyer and a the, then seller after first delivering a, to buyer a notice of buyer to perform may cancel this agreement. Seller after delivering to buyer a notice to buyer to perform may cancel this agreement. So you just can't cancel the agreement. 
you can't say, well, you're late by one day. Um, I cancel the agreement. So notice to perform, notice to buyer to perform, and notice there, there's a notice, there's a notice to seller to perform. So the notice to buyer to perform basically says, notice to buyer to perform, and there can be more than one. And so the seller gives buyer notice to remove all the following contingencies or to take the specified action. All contingencies, and you can check the ones that you want and um, where am I going with this? So, notice the buyer to reform, and according with the residential purchase agreement, whatever, dated, you still have to make sure you've dated it right. And then um, paragraph refers, buyer, if you do not remove contingencies, and there's the form for that, or take the contractual actions within two or blank days after delivery, but no less than the time specified in this agreement by to perform, seller may cancel. Now, changing it from two, there's a, you know, if um, I've had agents say, well, how about if I just check the box and say zero? Uh, you know, the, there's a reason that it says two days because the court doesn't like people playing gotcha. And so you're supposed to give the buyer two days to perform. You could give them longer. Shortening it may end up uh, hurting your argument in an arbitration hearing. Can I ask a strategic question? What yeah. if you're representing both parties and the buyer isn't performing? You know, you don't want to be putting yourself in the position to, you know, give them a notice to perform. I mean, it's awkward. Is there a, and they're just not performing, so. Is it better just to try to get canceled? Or the, the reason, or the, the, there's a, um, a, a legal theory, or theory, it's a legal precept that essentially says if you sleep on your rights, you lose them. And there's a clause in the contract that says time is of the essence. And what happens is, is that if you as a seller start to just ignore deadlines, then you lose the right to enforce them later. Right? And if the buyer ignores deadlines and nobody does anything, if the deadlines just come and go and nobody does anything, then the presumption could be that you guys really don't care about deadlines anymore. So then you can't all of a sudden find religion and say deadlines are important. If you don't, within so many days, I'm going to because you've already blown through several of them. So what you should do is you should, let's say, go to the seller first and say, buyer's not performing. Now, by the way, what some agents do, I find this a teensy bit annoying, but what they'll do is two days before contingency removal is supposed to happen, they'll send you the notice to perform with all the boxes checked. Because it says two days, huh? two days. That way, they're canceling you the day after the date of the contingency removal. Otherwise, if you wait for contingency removal to come and go, and then you do the form, they got two more days and they could drag it out two or three days. Some agents do it in advance, a preemptive notice of the buyer to perform, right? Just to, just to do that. Some people find this annoying, right? I don't know. Um, the conversation you'd have with the seller is, so let's say you're having a conversation with sellers and the buyer's not performing, what do you want to do? And so it says, well, what are my options? Well, one is you could extend the time period. Right, so if we make an addendum that gives them another week, then we are still saying we're playing by the rules, the time is of the essence, we've just given them more time. That's different than just ignoring the time period that is in the contract and pretending it doesn't exist. If you do that too often, it, 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 it doesn't work as well. So the other thing, so, and so the seller says, well, I don't want to give them more time, what can I do? You can cancel, right? The only options the seller really has is to extend or cancel right and change the conditions well or waive the the yeah, way you know, renegotiate the, the contract right. renegotiate the contract that's always a third option right but i'm saying within the context of this particular contract you can either extend or cancel 
And what can the buyer do? The buyer can request repairs or something, get an extension or cancel. But it really comes down to that. All right. Pretty soon we're going to have all the forms in the... See, this is what you do if you ever do like a home seller seminar. You print out, or home buyer, you print out a copy of every every form and give it to them. So here, read this. Read this. Um, all right. So that's, I don't know what else to say about that. Other than the buyer either, once the buyer has removed the contingency, they no longer have a right to back out based upon that contingency. Close of escrow. Um, before buyer or seller may cancel this agreement for failure of the party to close escrow pursuant to this agreement, buyer and seller must first deliver to the other party demand to close escrow, which is another form. And this is the form, this is the form you would use. I might as well do this. Demand to close escrow. So, um, if they're not closing on time, them being the buyer, usually, not the seller, then they keep dragging it on. You should either extend it or demand that they close. And so this is a different form from the notice of the buyer to perform. It's a demand to close escrow. And you check on that. And basically it says within three days after receiving no order then agreed on either close uh, escrow date. If by, if you do not close escrow by the end of the time period specified in the demand to close escrow and the seller has fully performed, seller may immediately cancel this agreement. Bring legal action against you for damages. Bring legal action against you to, to force you to buy the property. Specific performance. That's a hard one to get. And then um, and then buyer hereby demands that seller close escrow. So this is a, a two-edged form. Right? Um, demand to close escrow. Right? And uh, pretty soon we're going to have them all. Not even close to them all. All right, so we've done all that. Page four, we've done five. This is it. So repairs, generally just as you're supposed to do it before escrow closes, prorations of taxes, that's all going to be done um, by the escrow company. Broker's compensation, it just says that basically you're supposed to pay based upon what it says in the listing agreement. Um, and then this is another boilerplate disclo disclosure that basically says um, we're not responsible for anything. Right? We don't know what's going on. We do not decide that what price the buyer should pay. We do not guarantee the condition. We do not guarantee performance. We don't guarantee anything. Right, we're just we're just jockeys in this, is that right? Not uh, we're not the horse. Um, and then this talks about representative capacity, which would come up. I'm not going to get into that in great detail, but let's say it's an officer of a corporation or an LLC that's buying or a trust or something like that. Um, uh, then this is just about escrow instructions, liquidated damages. Uh, I don't know what to say about this other than it's um, difficult to um, get sellers to agree without the buyer agreeing to liquidate the damages. It's very difficult to get the buyer to accept an offer without it. Um, it's typical that the buyer and seller agree to liquidate the damages. Mediation is like marriage counseling. You know, you can go to marriage counseling and just ignore everything the marriage counselor says. Is that right? And arbitration is like divorce court, right? Where, and uh, basically by agreeing to this, arbitration is, the reality is, is that the California, the, the, the code in Santa Clara County would send any court case like this to arbitration anyhow, whether this was initialed or not. The difference by initialing this is that it becomes what's called binding arbitration, which means it's virtually impossible to appeal. Virtually impossible to appeal. You, for example, cannot appeal based on the argument that the arbitrator simply got the decision wrong. 
right? That's not grounds for appeal, right? If you could prove that the arbitrator was bribed, coerced, or something like that, it's very difficult to appeal arbitration. What this also says, by the way, someplace in here, um, it says what's excluded from mediation, and the big one on this is the uh, small claims court. Um, and it also says someplace about attorney's fees right here. So basically this, uh, one of, this says that if one of the, if, if, if you're, if somebody, if the buyer says we want to mediate and the seller says no, and then they, um, that, that party, sh they cannot recover attorney's fees if they win. So if you refuse mediation and you go to court and win, typically if you win, you get attorney's fees in addition, but because you refuse mediation, you don't get attorney's fees. They're basically encouraging you to mediate, right? That's what that's. So oh, that may have been way too technical. Was that way too technical? But anyhow, that's just, if you read the fine print. And I haven't looked at the most recent PRDS, but one of the differences between the PRDS and the CIR is the PRDS doesn't have that clause in it that basically coerces people into mediation. It doesn't have the attorney fees clause. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, at least I haven't read the most recent edition of the PRDS, so I'm not saying I know for sure. Uh, MLS, uh, attorney's fees, assignment, terms and conditions. Time is of the essence. Huh? Remember that? This essence, the word essence here doesn't mean smell. <laughs> it comes from a French word that means the heart of the matter. And then there's all these other little definitions. By the way, days. When it says days, it means calendar days. Days after means um, the number of calendar days after. The, the, most of that, you, 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 I've gotten into arguments about what, how many days it is. Uh, expiration, if you don't mark anything, by the way, or by, this is when you put in your name as agent, right? Now, don't actually type in your name as agent, but you would type in your name as the agent. Just, you have to be careful, right? Somebody will, I'll see one that says your name is agent. So, generally, we want, the. it says personally received personally received by buyer or by, if you represent the buyer, your name goes in here. If you don't do anything, there's three days. Is that business days? No, <laughs> three, three days. I get asked, I, I, I had a, oh, anyhow. That's I get calendar a, days. Calendar days. Okay. Um, one or more buyers signing this agreement represent a capacity. You check that. That's again, that's back there. And then they want you to do this RSCD form for additional things. I don't think we're going to go through that. Acceptance. This is for them to accept it. Um, notice there's a box um, where you could, and if there's a counter offer, which would be another class we might do later after, you know, I don't know. Um, I might do one later about counter offers. <laughs> but uh, there's a big box that says real estate brokers are not parties to the to this agreement. That's what it says. Is that what it says? And the cooperating broker compensation, there's a form called the CBC, the cooperating broker compensation. Now, what it says, what this paragraph basically says is that you're supposed to get whatever it says that you're going to get in the MLS. We've had cases where we sent an offer it's accepted, and it seemed like at that moment, the listing agent had changed the MLS, re reflecting less commission to the selling agent. Right now, the MLS has a timer on their program, and actually, it took a month for them to actually figure it out. But they found out that he had waited. It was like 20 minutes after they'd received the offer, he had changed the offer of I, you find this hard to believe, don't you? Don't you find this hard to believe? Yes. I want to mention to you, Brian, that uh, when the cat attack happened, 
uh, in my case. And I specifically reached out and asked them to mention pet spend in the MLS because it hadn't been mentioned prior, no warning or anything along those lines. They went ahead and did that. And when I came back and went through the process to get insurance to cover my hospital costs, um, they had a printout of the MLS after they had made the changes. Right. So the insurance guy thought that I was lying about having said that there was no warning because he had that and I just got lucky that I had printed out the MLS from the day that we went to see the property right. and had that contrast. So a good idea to print out the MLS the day you show the property. Yes. And, and certainly when you're writing an offer, you might want to print out the MLS as it is at that moment. Right. So that when the commission amount has changed, right? We don't, I haven't had that many cat attacks in my, um, but, but when that, you know, you'd already have it printed out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Anyhow, and then there's the buyer's investigation advisory. And by the way, I used to go through this with the buyer. Right? You, I, you ought to have read it, but basically you want the buyer to understand. Now, you don't have to do all this right now, but if the buyer is not going to do inspections, you want them to basically initial that they're not going to do it. You, you want them to say, I, I decline to do any inspections. And there's an inspection form that we have and there's an inspection form that is in the CAR, which uh, I'm not gonna do today. So is there an official place to have them visit? Yeah, all right, so there's two different forms. The office has one, but why not? Um, is it important to do that on raw land too? Not as much. With raw land, what is the big inspection for raw land? or how about the, what are the boundaries, right? right. It, the, the biggest dispute involving vacant land is boundary disputes because fences are not, you know, don't necessarily have anything to do with the boundary line. And having an engineer go out there and actually mark the boundaries can be expensive. And Surveyor. surveyors, that's what I meant. Well, they, they're called surveying engineers, but yeah. So, um, so, that would be that, and, and if, 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 if people say, I would always make sure that they understand that the fences are not necessarily the boundaries and that they would, should be encouraged to have a survey done of the property, which can cost a couple of grand, right? Certainly more than a thousand, depending on how big it is and if there's hills and how hard it is and that sort of stuff. Because then they'll argue that they didn't realize that the, they thought the fence was the boundary and then they didn't do it. So what you would, and by the way, if they sent you, if you sent them an email that said, I strongly recommend in the purchase of land that you have the boundaries inspected. And you know, there's other things, if they're planning to put in a well, they should have done tests and things like that in advance. But you basically, if they send you one back that says, I, I ain't doing it, then that's okay. So buyer's inspection elections, why don't we do this? And also buyer inspection waiver. Why not? And then we'll will have ended our time. So buyer inspection elections, and notice there's a whole bunch of yeses and nos. So I would let people, I would make sure that they, I would have, now, and by the way, this is one of those where it doesn't work, right? Because the boxes, I guess, are too small. So this one, you actually have to print out, or if you've got a lot of time on your hands in Adobe Acrobat, you can go put it in your own little boxes on each side. Uh, I don't know, but, um, that's that's so that and we have a form too that's very similar and so um if you don't like that one then there's the buyer inspection waiver which is basically a very specific initial here home inspection termite others initial here so if they're uh, and and i usually use a much longer version of this but if they're saying we don't want a property inspection, we don't want a termite inspection, we don't, even if, if the seller already had them and they said we don't want to order our own, I would have them fill out this form, right? Just so, because what will happen is they'll say, you understand two termite inspections can be very different in terms of what they find. I mean, the dollar amounts can be huge. 
So later they find something that was broken that was not disclosed in the termite report that they were shown and they're going to be saying, I told Georgia we ought to get another one, and she told us not to. And, and you know, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll say stuff like that, right? They'll say stuff like that. You know, Gloria talked us out of it. We were going to do it, but she said don't. So it's a lot better if you say we're recommending, best practice would be to order a whole new set of inspections too. And they said, we don't need to do that. Great, I understand. Initial here, initial here. It's much more difficult for them to say, that they didn't know what they were doing when they initial right next to us, right? Just saying. So, Mike, in the initial, you can have an initial that if, if they do have inspections that the seller has like a termite or a property uh, inspection, you can have them um, initial the front page of that saying that they looked at that. At that they should be doing that anyhow. The listing agent is the one who wants that, them to initial the front page of each of the inspections. The listing agent wants them to do that. All right. Okay. Was that enough? There's always more.